Hi guys, Claudia Boleyn here, and this is a video about the 4th of May, 1536. Apologies if the audio sounds low, I am recording this on my iPad because my laptop battery has died, and I apologise for the delay in you seeing this because of that, but this is being recorded on the 4th of May. So on the 4th of May, two new men are arrested. We have poor Sir Francis Weston, who Anne was told had already been arrested with her. She was tricked, she was thinking about how he could have been arrested, and tragically ended up providing the information they needed needed to bring him in in the first place. But we also have a man called Sir William Brereton who is arrested on this day. Now this is extremely odd because Sir William Brereton isn't even in Anne and George's circle of friends. There's no way he would even have had the opportunity to commit adultery with Anne. So who is William Brereton and why is he arrested? Now there's two potential reasons. Sir William Brereton is extremely powerful and influential in Cheshire and the north of Wales. He also has a reputation for being quite corrupt. So this is a pretty easy easy way for Thomas Cromwell, who is orchestrating this plot, to take him out of the equation, because A, he's corrupt, potentially, and B, because Cromwell wants to sort out the power for himself, he wants to decide who's in charge, this is a really easy way to get rid of him. But second, William Brereton is quite close to Henry Fitzroy. Now, Henry Fitzroy is the king's illegitimate son. When Henry VIII was still married to Catherine of Aragon, he had a mistress called Bessie Blount, she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Henry Fitzroy. He's called called Fitzroy because Fitzroy literally just means son of the king. Now this boy is very important to Henry VIII because you know how much he wants a male heir and this is the proof that he can have a male heir. And throughout his life, Henry VIII hasn't really treated Henry Fitzroy like a bastard. He was so worried at one point about the fact he only had one heir and that she was a girl, that's Mary I, who's going to become Bloody Mary, that it's said that there were plans to marry Henry Fitzroy with his half-sister, Lady Mary. Thankfully that didn't happen, but Henry Fitzroy is pretty well looked after, and I think it's clear that in the back of Henry VIII's mind, he is still thinking this boy could potentially be his heir one day. Now he is really close to Sir William Brereton, and as we know from history, the person who helps to bring up the heir is quite formative in their views, the sort of king they're going to become, and they can become even more powerful. Cromwell is not going to want that, he's not going to want Brereton to be in that role, so that's another reason why Cromwell just decides to take Brereton out. Henry Norris's servant, now that is one of Anne's friends, that is the groom of the stall, he said about William Brereton being arrested, by my truth, if any of them was innocent, it was he. And that's just because there is no opportunity for him to have committed adultery anyway. The other men were friends of Anne and part of her circle, so it's quite easy for Cromwell to think of times when these people could have been together. Brereton wasn't even in that situation, so this is clearly just a power grab for Cromwell. So Brereton's been brought to the Tower, and Sir Francis Weston has been brought to the Tower. Both of these men are going to be executed for adultery. So the second big event on the 4th of May has to do with George. So George receives a letter from his wife, Jane Boleyn, on the 4th of May. If you watch shows about the Tudors, if you read a lot of literature, historical fiction about the Tudors, then you may have already encountered Jane Boleyn, and it's quite upsetting that she is now considered historically a bit of a villain. There is absolutely no evidence for that. Especially in the Philippa Gregory series, she is portrayed as scheming, calculating, jealous and bitter, but we have absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. We don't even know that George and Jane didn't get on, yet for some reason they are always depicted in fiction as having a really unhappy marriage. We don't know anything about their marriage. So Jane's message to George promises that she will humbly make suit unto the King's Highness. Basically that means that she's going to try and intercede for him and she's going to try and contact the King. Now she never does contact the king, and a lot of people have used this to construct her villain persona, but actually the king was pretty much in isolation at this point. Nobody was able to see the king even if they wanted to. So it's just as likely that she attempted to send letters to the king or she wanted to see the king, but she wasn't able to. Now Jane's message to George is delivered cruelly by two people that George hates. So there's Sir Nicholas Carew. I spoke about him briefly before. When things were first going wrong for the Boleyns, George was due to become a knight in the Order of the Garter, and everyone expected that he would get the position, but instead Henry gave the position to Nicholas Carew. Nicholas Carew is a Catholic, he's very anti the Boleyns, so it's especially cruel that he would be sent to deliver this message. We also have a man called Francis Bryan, who is referred to sometimes as the Vicar of Hell because of how incredibly ruthless he was, and this is someone that George had previously had 
had a big quarrel with. They did not get on at all. So it's really cruel that these are the men who are chosen to deliver this message. When George receives the letter from Jane, he tells Kingston that he wants to give her thanks. Now, we don't know as much about George's mental state as we do about Anne's, but obviously, if you are imprisoned for something that you haven't done, and you know that you could end up being killed, George thinks he probably will end up being killed, he is in a horrible situation. He's obviously not taking it well. He's very upset. He asks Kingston what time he is due to come before the council. But then he starts weeping, he starts crying, and he says, For I think I shall not come forth till I come to my judgment. So pretty much like Anne before, when she started laughing, when Kingston said that every subject under the king will have justice, he knows that he's not going to get justice. He doesn't think he's going to be able to plead his case. He doesn't think that it's going to be a fair trial. He pretty much knows at this point that he's going to be killed for something that he didn't do. And this would have been especially painful for someone like George, because like Anne, George is extremely articulate. He's charismatic. He's witty. He will do so well at trial and he would be able to convince people of his cause. So Cromwell is doing everything he can to make sure George does not know the full extent of his accusations. He wants George to end up on trial with no clue what's going on. He wants to keep him off balance because he knows that George is such a good speaker. As for Anne at this point, she's still experiencing the symptoms of a mental breakdown. She's still trying to work out how she managed to get here, how it's happened so fast, how she as an innocent woman has ended up in this position, how God has let that happen. At one point she even wonders if this is all a trick, this is all a test, if maybe this is something Henry set up to test what a good queen she is. She says, but I think the king does it to prove me. And that thought doesn't last very long, but she's going through so many thoughts. She's, as I said, experiencing those mental breakdown symptoms. She's trying to make sense of it all, which is impossible, of course, because none of it actually does make sense. Anne said that she hoped the bishops would speak up for her and that the people of the country would pray for her. Kingston says in another letter to Cromwell that Anne has apparently said to him, she wants to pass on a letter to Cromwell which says that it will not rain until she is delivered out of the tower. So there will be no rain until she leaves the tower. This is Anne's mental state right now. She thinks that the only way she will be freed is by God's intervention. And she is starting to think that God will stop the rain falling unless she is released. She is hysterical at this point. She is panicking. Nothing feels real to her, as you can imagine. Anne is very religious. Her faith means so much to her. And she can't believe that her God would let this happen. She says... And then shall I be in heaven, for I have done many good deeds in my days, but I think much unkindness in the king to put such about me as I never loved. So again, she's confirming to herself that she's not guilty of any of the charges, so if she dies, she's consoling herself that she will go to heaven and she knows that. And she's again really upset to be surrounded by enemies, because she knows at this point that the women around her are just there to spy on her. Kingston, although he is polite to her, is reporting on her to Cromwell. She is surrounded by enemies. At this point, that's the most unkind thing to her that the king has done, surrounding her by these enemies so she can't have any peace. Okay, guys, thanks for watching. I will see you soon with another instalment. I hope the volume's okay and um, keep safe. Right, love you loads and I'll see you really soon. Bye!